chapter sixty three of the maid of scar this is a librivox recording all librivox recordings are in the public domain for more information or to volunteer please visit librivox dot org the maid of scar by r d blackmore chapter sixty three polly at home lest any one should be surprised that sir philip bampfylde could have paid two visits to this delightful neighbourhood without calling on our leading gentleman and his own fellow-officer colonel lower in which case the questions concerning delushy would have been sifted long ago i had better say at once what it was that stopped him when the general thought it just worth while though his hopes were faint about it to inquire into the twisted story of the wreck on our coast as given by the celebrated felix farley the first authority he applied to was coroner bowles who had held the inquest coroner bowles told him all he knew half of which was wrong of course by means of hezekiah and gave him a letter to anthony stew as the most active and penetrating magistrate of the neighbourhood nothing could have been more unlucky not only did stew baffle my desire to be more candid than the day itself by his official browbeating and the antipathy between us not only did stew like an over-sharp fellow trust one of the biggest rogues unhung in his unregenerate dissenting days and before he gave him six dozen which certainly proved his salvation i am sorry to say such things of my present good neighbour kiah but here he is now and subscribes to it hezekiah perkins whose view of the shipwreck and learned disquisition on sand misled the poor coroner and all of the jury except myself so blindly that we drowned the five young men and smothered the baby not only did stew i say get thus far in bewilderment of the subject but he utterly ruined all chance of clearing it by keeping sir philip from candleston court if you ask me how i can only say in common fairness to anthony stew who has lately gone poor fellow to be cross-examined by somebody sharper even than himself one to whom i would never afford material for unpleasant questions by speaking amiss of a man in his power especially when so needless in a word to treat stew as i hope myself to be treated by survivors i admit that he may not have wished to keep sir philip away from the colonel but the former having once accepted stew's keen hospitality and tried to eat fish which i might have bettered had i known of his being there felt with his usual delicacy that he ought not to visit a man at feud with the host whose salt and very little else he was then enjoying for mrs stew was more bitter of course than even her husband against colonel lower and roundly abused him the very first evening of sir philip's stay with them so that the worthy general passed the gates of the excellent colonel half a dozen times perhaps without once passing through them enough about that and i need only say before returning to my own important and perhaps gaseous inquiries in devonshire that the news so hastily blurted out by captain rodley blewett caused many glad hearts in our parish and neighbourhood but nevertheless two sad ones of these one belonged to roger burkrolls and the other to moxie thomas the child had so won upon both these not only by her misfortunes and the way in which she bore them but by her loving disposition bright manner and docility that it seemed very hard to lose her so even though it were for her own good upon this latter point master burkwells when i came to see him held an opinion the folly of which surprised me from a man of such reading and history in real earnest he laid down that it might be a very bad thing for the maid and make against her happiness to come of a sudden into high position importance and even money such sentiments are to be found i believe in the weaker parts of the bible such as are called the new testament which nobody can compare to the works of my ancestor king david and which if you put aside st paul and st peter who cut the man's ear off and rejected quite rightly the tablecloth exhibit to my mind nobody of a patriotic spirit as for moxie she would not have been a woman if she had doubted about the value of high position coin of the realm and rich raiment nevertheless she cried bitterly that this child is good as her own to her and given her to make up for them and now so clever to see to things and to light the fire and show her the way lady bluett put her dress on 
should be taken away in a heap as it were just as if the great folk had minded her she blamed our poor bunny for stealing the heart of young watkin who might have had the maid according to his mother's fancy with money enough to restock the farm now things had proved so handsome as if everybody did not know that bardie would never think twice of watkin while his mother hearing of the ships i had taken as all over the parish reported had put poor watkin on bread and water until he fell in love with bunny however now she cried very severely and in a great measure she meant it leaving all newton and nottage and scar and even bridge end to consider these matters with a pleasing divergence of facts and conclusions i find it my duty however repugnant to speak once more of my humble self in adversity my native dignity and the true grandeur of cambria have always united against my own feelings to make me almost self-confident or at any rate able to maintain my position and knock under to nobody but in prosperity all this drops extreme affability and my native longing to give pleasure mark my deportment towards all the world and i almost never commit an assault in this fine and desirable frame of mind i arrived at narnton court once more sooner perhaps than captain bluett having so much further to go burst in on his friends at candleston although i have given his story precedence not only on account of his higher rank but because of the hurry he was in on the other hand my part seemed to be of a nice and delicate character to find out all that i could without making any noise in the neighbourhood to risk no chance if it might be helped of exciting sir philip bampfylde and above all things no possibility of arousing chowne till the proper time for his craft was so great that he might destroy every link of evidence if he once knew that we were in chase of him even as he could out fox a fox when things of importance take their hinge a good deal upon feminine evidence the first thing a wise man always does is to seek female instinct if he sees his way to guide it and to have the helm of a woman nothing is so certain as a sort of a promise of marriage a man need not go too very far and must be awake about pen and ink and witnesses and so on but if he knows how to do it and has lost an arm in battle but preserved an unusually fine white beard and has had another wife before who was known to make too little of him the fault is his own if he cannot manage half a dozen spinsters my reputation had outrun me as it used to do sometimes too often for in the dispatches my name came after scarcely more than fifty though it should have been one of the foremost five however my wound was handsomely chronicled and with a touch of my own description such as is really heartfelt of course it was not quite cured yet and i felt very shy about it and the very last thing i desired was for the women to come bothering tush i have no patience with them they make such a fuss of a trifle but being bound upon such an errand and anxious to conciliate them so far as self-respect allowed and knowing that if i denied myself to them the movement would be much greater i let them have peeps and perceive at the same time that i really did want a new set of shirts half a dozen of damsels began at once to take my measure and the result will last my lifetime but amid all this glorification whenever i thought of settling there was one pretty face that i longed to see and to my mind it beat the whole of them what was become of my pretty polly the lover of my truthful tales and did she still remember a brave though not young officer in the navy who had saved her from the jaws of death by catching smallpox from her these questions were answered just in time and in the right manner also by the appearance of polly herself out blushing the rose at sight of me and without a spot on her face except from the very smart veil she was wearing for she was no longer a servant now but free and independent and therefore entitled to take the veil and she showed her high spirit by doing this to the deep indignation of all our maid-servants and still more indignant were these young women when polly demeaned herself as they declared with a perfectly shameless and brazen-faced manner of carrying on towards the noble old tar 
they did not allow for the poor thing's gratitude to the only one who came nigh her in her despairing hour and saved her life thereby nor yet for her sorrow and tender feeling at the dire consequence to him and it was not in their power perhaps to sympathize with the shock she felt at my maimed and war-beaten appearance however i carried the whole of it off in a bantering manner as usual still there was one resolution i came to after long puzzling in what way to cope with the almost fatal difficulty of having to trust a woman so i said to myself that if this must be done i might make it serve two purposes first for discovery of what i sought and then for a test of the value of a female about whom i had serious feelings these were in no way affected by some news i picked up from nanette or as she now called herself the widow heaviside not that my old friend had left this world but that he gave a wide berth to the part containing his beloved partner she with a frenchwoman's wit and sagacity saw the advantage of remaining in the neighbourhood of her wrongs and here with the pity now felt for her and the help she received from sir philip himself and her own skill in getting up women's fallals she maintained her seven children cleverly after shedding some natural tears for the admired but fugitive heaviside she came round of course to her neighbour's affairs and though she had not been at narnton court at the time when the children were stolen she helped me no little by telling me where to find one who knew all that was known of it this was a farmer's wife now at burrington as i found out afterwards a village some few leagues up the taw and her name was mrs shapland from her my friend the captain shall decouve the everything of this horrible affair said nanette who now spoke fine english she was the what you call the bun the guard of the lethal infants i know not where she leaves some barbarous name i do forget but she have one cousin a jolly girl of the lethal name pray how can you make such thing of mary what do you mean polly i asked that is what we make of mary and what polly is it then madame yes polly the polly which had that horrible pest that make holes in the faces Barol, we call it the polly that was in the great mansion until she had the money left the niece of the proud woman of manage you shall with great facility find that polly of course i could for she had told me where i might call upon her which i did that very same afternoon and a pretty and very snug cottage it was just a furlong or so above the fine old village of braunton with four or five beautiful meadows around it and a bright pebbly brook at the turn of the lane the cottage itself even now in november was hung all over with china roses and honeysuckle in its second bloom which it often shows in devonshire and up at the window that shook off the thatch and looked wide awake as a dog's house a face more bright than the roses came and went away and came again to put a good face upon being caught hereupon i dismissed the boys who with several rounds of cheers had escorted me through braunton and with genuine thankfulness i gazed at the quiet and pleasing prospect so charming now in the fall of the leaf what would it be in the spring-time with the meadows all breaking anew into green and the trees all ready for their leaves again also these bright red devonshire cows all belonging to polly and even now streaming milkily a firkin apiece was the least to expect of them in the merry may month a very deep feeling of real peace and the pleasure of small things fell on me for a man of so many years and one arm might almost plead to himself some right to shed his experience over the earth when his blood had been curdling on so many seas the very same thought was in polly's eyes when she ran down and opened the door for me the whole of this property was her own or would be at least when her old grandmother would allow herself to be buried that old woman now was ninety-five if the parsons had minded the register and a woman more fully resolved to live on i never had the luck to meet with and the worst of it was that her consent to polly's marriage was needful under the ancient cowkeeper's will with all of the meadows so described that nobody could get out of them hereupon somehow i managed to see that a very bold stroke was needed and i took it and won the old lady over by downright defiance i told her that she was a great deal too young to have any right to an opinion and when she should come to my time of life she would find me ready to hearken her 
she said that no doubt it was bred from the wars for sailors to talk so bravely but that i ought to know better with a fie and a sigh and a fie again to none of this would i give ear but began to rebuke all the young generations holding to ridicule those very points upon which they especially plumed themselves until this most excellent woman began to count all her cows on her fingers her can't have them no her shan't have they she cried with a power which proved that she saw them dropping into my jaws almost her han't a got em yet and why should her have em into this very fine feeling and sense of possession i entered so amiably that amid much laughter and many blushes on the part of polly who pretended to treat the whole thing as a joke the old lady put on her silver goggles and set down her name to a memorandum prepared on the spur of the moment by me whereupon i quite made my mind up to go bravely in for it and recompense polly for all her faith and gratitude and frugality if she should prove herself capable of keeping counsel also to this intent i expressed myself as elegantly as could be having led polly out to the wooden bridge that nobody else might hear me for that fine old woman became so deaf all of a sudden that i had no faith in any more of her organs and desired to be at safe distance from her as well as to learn something more of the cows nor did i miss the chance for all of them having been milked by polly came up to know what i had to say to her and their smell was beautiful so i gave them a bit of salt out of my pocket such as i always carry when ashore and offered them some tobacco and they put out their broad yellow lips for the one and snorted and sneezed at the other when these valuable cows were gone to have a little more grazing i just made polly aware of the chance that appeared to be open before us in short i laid clearly before her the whole of my recent grand discovery proving distinctly that with nothing more than a little proper management i possessed therein at least an equivalent for her snug meadow homestead and all the milch cows and the trout stream only she must not forget one thing namely that the whole of this value would vanish if a single word of this story were breathed any further off than our own two selves until the time was ripe for it of course i had not been quite such a fool as to give nanette the smallest inkling of any motive on my part beyond that pure curiosity with which she could so well sympathize also it had been settled between captain bluett and myself that a fortnight was to be allowed me for hunting up all the evidence before he should cross the channel unless i took it on myself to fetch him polly opened her blue eyes to such a size at all i told her that i became quite uneasy lest she should open her mouth in proportion for if my discovery once took wind before its entire completion there would be at least fifty jealous fellows thrusting their oars into my own rowlocks and robbing me of my own private enterprise also miss polly gave way to a feeling of anger and indignation which certainly might be to some extent natural but was to say the least of it in a far greater measure indiscreet and even perilous oh the villain oh the cruel villain she exclaimed in a voice that quite alarmed me considering how near the footpath was and a minister of the gospel too oh the poor little babes one adrift on the sea and the other among them naked savages what a mercy as they didn't eat em and to blame the whole of it on a nice harmless kind-spoken handsome gentleman like our captain oh let me get hold of him that my dear polly we never shall do if you raise your voice in this way now come away from these trees with the ivy and let us speak very quietly this dear creature did as nearly as could be expected what i told her so that i really need not repent of my noble faith in the female race this encouraged me from its tendency to abolish prejudice and to let the weaker vessels show that there is such a thing as a cork to them men are apt to judge too much by experience on this subject when they ought to know that experience never does apply to women any more than reason does nevertheless my polly saw the way in and out of a lot of things which to me were difficult especially as to the manner of handling her cousin mrs shapland a very good woman in her way but a ticklish one to deal with and all the credit for all the truth we got out of mrs shapland belongs not to me any more than herself but goes down in a lump to poor polly 
to pass this lightly as now behooves me just let me tell what susan chaplin said when i worked it out of her any man can get the truth out of a woman if he knows the way i mean of course so far as she had been able to receive it to expect more than this is unreasonable and to get that much is wonderful however polly and i between us did get a good deal of it of course we did not let this good woman even guess what we wanted with her only we borrowed a farmer's cart from bang my old boy who was now set up in a farm on his grandmother's ashes and his horse was not to be found fault with if a man did his duty in lashing him this i was ready to understand when pointed out by polly and he never hoisted his tail but what i raked him under his counter so after a long hill commanding miles and miles of the course of the river we fetched up in the courtyard of farmer shopland and found his wife a brisk sharp woman quite ready to tell her story but what she did first and for us at this moment was to rouse up the fire with a great dry faggot crackling and sparkling merrily for the mist of november was now beginning to crawl up the wavering valley and the fading light from the west struck coldly on the winding river in such a case and after a drive of many miles and much scenery any man loves to see pots and pans goaded briskly to bubbling and sputtering or even to help in the business himself so far as the cook will put up with it and then if a foolish good woman allows him as pride sometimes induces her to lift up a pot lid when trembling with flavour or give a shake to the frying pan in the ecstasy of crackling or even to blow on the iron spoon and then draw in his breath with a drop of it what can he want with any scenery out of the window or outside his waistcoat such was my case i declare to you in that hospitable house with these good people of burrington nor could we fall to any other business until this was done with then after dark we drew round the fire with a black jack of grand old ale and our pipes to hear mrs chaplin's story End of chapter sixty three chapter sixty four of the maid of scar this is a librivox recording all librivox recordings are in the public domain for more information or to volunteer please visit librivox dot org the maid of scar by r d blackmore chapter sixty four susan quite acquits herself it really does seem as wise a plan as any i am acquainted with to let this good woman act according to the constitution of her sex that is to say to say her say and never be contradicted we contradicted her once or twice to reconcile her to herself but all that came of it was to make her contradict perhaps herself but certainly us ten times as much she did her best to explain her meaning and we really ought to enter more into their disabilities therefore let her tell her story as nearly in her own words poor thing as my sense of the english language can in any style agree with i was nurse at narnton court ever so many years ago when my name was susan moggeridge charlie you cannot deny it you know and all of us must be content to grow old it is foolish to look at things otherwise twelve and six that makes eighteen now captain wells you know it do and charlie can you say otherwise then it must have been eighteen years agone when i was took on for under nurse because the princess was expecting the same as the butler told me and it came to pass on a sunday night with two miles away from the doctor orders had been given but they foreigners always do belie them too soon always or too late and these two little dears was too soon by reason of the wonderful child the eldest one was prepared for a maid she was and the other a boy two real beauties both of them as fair as could be with little clear dots under their skin in corner places because of their mother the princess but nothing as any one would observe except for a beauty 
to both of them the boy was the biggest though the girl came first and first was her nature in everything except of course in fatness and by reason of always dancing not six months old was that child before she could dance on the kitchen table with only one hand to hold her up and a pleasure it was to look at her and laugh with her little funny face and nod her head she would as if she saw to the bottom of everything and when she was scarce turned the twelvemonth she could run like oh just like anything and roll over and over on the grass with her pomeroleanian dog as she called him and there wasn't a word in the language as ever come amiss to her but for the r's or the y's in it words such as i could lay no tongue to she would take and pronounce right off and then laugh at herself and everybody and the way she used to put her hands out laying down the law to all of us we didn't want a showman in the house so long as we had miss bertha or barty as she called herself though christened after her mother everybody the poor little mite she expected everybody to know her name and all about her and nothing put her in such a passion as to pretend not to know who she was i's barty she used to cry out with her little hands spread and her bright eyes flashing i's barty i tell a and every body knows it oh yes and she never could say the but nis and nat for this and that and how angry she used to be to be sure if anybody mocked her as we used to do for the fun of it but even there she was up to us for she began to talk french for revenge upon us having taken the trick from her mother likewise the boy was a different child altogether in many ways he scarcely could learn to speak at all because he was a very fine child indeed and quiet and fat and easy he would lie by four hours on a velvet cushion and watch his little sister having her perpetual round of play dolls and horses and noah's arks and all the things that were alive to her and she talking to them whiles the hour he took no more notice than just to stroke them and say boo boo or poor poor which was nearly all that he could say not that he was to blame of course nor would any one having sense think of it especially after he took the pink fever and it struck to his head and they cut his hair off beautiful curls as was ever seen and some of them in my drawer upstairs now with the colour of gold streaking over them philip his name was of course from sir philip and being the heir to the title but his clever sister she always called him little brother as if he was just born almost when he weighed pretty nearly two of her sir philip the good old gentleman was away in foreign parts they said or commanding some of the colonies up to the time when these two twins were close upon two years old or so i remember quite well when he came home with his luggage marked general bampfylde and we said it was disrespectful of the government to call him so when his true name was sir philip he had never seen his grandchildren till now and what a fuss he made with them but they had scarcely time to know him before they were sadly murdered or worse perhaps for all that any one knows to the contrary because sir philip's younger son captain drake bampfylde came from the seas and america just at this time no one expected him of course from among such distant places and he had not been home for three years at least and how noble he did look until we saw how his shirts were cobbled and every one all about the place said that his little finger was worth the whole of the squire's body because the squire his elder brother and the heir of sir philip was of a nature not to say but i cannot make it clear to you no one could say a word against him only he were not what you may call it not as we devonshire people are not with a smile and kind look of the eye the same as captain drake was this poor captain drake poor or bad i scarce know which to put it after all i have heard of him 
anyhow his mind was set upon a little chit of a thing not more than fifteen at this time her name was isabel carey and her father had been a nobleman and when he departed this life he ordered her off to norrington court so she did at an early age and being so beautiful as some thought she was desperate with the captain they used to go walking all up in the woods or down on the river in a boat until it was too bad of them the captain i dare say meant no harm and perhaps he did none but still there are sure to be talkative people who want to give their opinions if charlie had carried on so with me whatever should i have thought of myself well there was everybody saying very fine things to everybody gay doings likewise and great feasts and singing and dancing and all the rest and the captain hired a pleasure-boat by name the wild duck of appledore and i never shall forget the day when he took a whole pack of us for a sail out over barnstaple bar and back i was forced to go because he needs must take the children and several even old people were sick but no one a quarter so bad as me and it came into my mind in that state that he was longing as well as welcome to cast us all into the raging sea however the lord preserved us this little ship had one mast as they call it and he kept her generally in a little bend just above the salmon weir so as to see the bend draw the pool and himself to shoot the wild fowl from a covered place there is and by reason of being so long at sea he could not sleep comfortable at the court but must needs make his bed in this pleasuring ship and to it he used to go to and fro in a little white boat as belonged to it all this time the weather was so hot we could scarcely bear our clothes on and were ready to envy them scandalous savages belonging to the famous parson chowne who went about with no clothes on there was one of these known to be down on the burrows a bathing of his wife and family if a decent woman may name them so well the whole of these gay goings-on to celebrate the return of sir philip and of captain drake and all that they owed to the lord for his goodness was to finish up with a great dinner to all the tenants on the property and then on the children's birthday a feasting of all the gentry around and a dance with all sorts of outlandish dresses and masks on in the evening for the fashion of this was come down from london and there had been a party of this sort over to lord bassett's and the neighbourhood was wild with it and after this everything was to be quiet because my lady the princess bertha was again beginning to expect almost and now captain wells you would hardly believe what a blow there was sent by the will of the lord upon all of this riot and revelry there was many of us having pious disposals as well as religious bringings up whose stomachs really was turned by the worldliness as was around us young ladies of the very best families instead of turning their minds to the lord turning of themselves about with young men laying hold of them as if there was nothing more to be said than kiss me quick and i'll do it again but there was a judgment coming they might lay the blame on me if they like there is folk as knows better that very night it was so hot with the sun coming up from the river that even the great hall the dance was to be in was only fit to lie down in so that captain drake in his man-of-war voice shouted and i think i can hear him now ladies and gentlemen i propose that we have our dance out on the terrace this was the open made-up flap between the house and the river and the captain's offer was caught up at directly the gentle folk seen the moon here they were going on ever so long and the more of twirling round they had and of making heel and toe and crossing arms and even frontresses the more they seemed to like it also the music up and down almost as bad as they was so that what with the harlequin dresses and masquerading and mummeries scarcely any one could have the head to be sure of any one else almost i could not help looking at them although my place was to heed the children only and keep them out of mischief and take them to bed at the proper time but captain drake who was here there and elsewhere making himself agreeable up he comes to me with a bottle and he says mary have some 
my name is not mary but susan sir and much at your service i answered so that he poured me a great glassful and said that it was sam something i was not so rude as to give him denial but made him a curtsy and drank it for it was not so strong as my father's cider no nor so good to my liking and for any to say that it got in my head shows a very spiteful woman the captain went on to the other maids as were looking on for the life of them all being out of doors you must mind and longing to have their turn at it but i held myself above them always and went back to my children these were in a little bower made up for the occasion with boughs of trees and twisted wood and moss from the forest to lie upon master philip was tired and heavy and working his eyes with the backs of his hands and yawning and falling away almost but that little bertha was as wide awake as a lark on her nest in the morning everywhere she was looking about for somebody to encourage her to have more play as she always called for and more play continually that child was so full of life it was more play all day long with her and even now in the fiery heat and thorough down thirst of the weather nothing was further from her mind than to go to bed without a gamble for it she had nothing on but her little shift or under frock i should call it made by myself when the hot weather came from a new jemmy set of the princess and cut out by my lady to fit her for the sake of the coolness her grand white upper frock trimmed with lace had been taken off by her papa i believe when the visitors would have her dance on the table and make speeches to them the poor little soul was so quick and so hot well i do declare to you captain wells and charlie polly likewise which will believe me though the men may not it was not more than a minute or so much perhaps i should say not half a minute as i happened to turn round to pass a compliment with a young man as seemed struck with me the sunday before in church time a sailor he were and had come with the captain and was his mate of the pleasure-boat a right-down handsome young man he was no call for you to be jealous charlie beneath the salt waves he do lie well i turned back my head in about five seconds and both of the babes was gone out of my sight at first i were not frightened much i took it for one of miss bertha's tricks to make off with her little brother so strong she was on her legs though light that many a time she would lift him up by his middle and carry him half round the room and then both of them break out laughing i'll whip you you see if i don't i cried as i ran round the corner to seek for them though whip them i never did poor dears any more than their own mother did i ran all about for five minutes at least around and among the branches stuck in to make the bower and every moment i made up my mind for miss bardie to pop out on me but pop out she never did nor will until the day of judgment when i began to see something more than an innocent baby trick in it and to think i dare say of these two babies value with all the land they were born to the first thing i did was to call out jack such being all sailors names of course but jack was gone out of all hearing and most folks said it was jack that took them to the contrary i could swear but who would listen to me when the lie went out that i was quite tipsy of the rest i cannot speak clearly because my heart flew right up into my brain directly moment the people came round shouting at me for the children and of these the very worst was parson chowne if it had been his own only children such as he says he is too good to have he scarcely could have been more rampageous not to use worse words of him the first thing that every one ran to of course was the parapetch and the river and a great cry was made for captain drake bampfylde from his knowledge of the waterways but though all the evening foremost in conducting everything now there was no sign to be had of him or of who had seen him last and it must have been an hour ere ever he come and then of course it was too late 
i was so beside myself all that night that i cannot tell how the time went by i remember looking over the parapet at a place where the water is always deep and seeing the fishermen from the salmon weir dragging their nets for the poor mites of bodies and my blood seemed to curdle inside me almost every time they came out with a stone or a log nothing was found from that night to this day and nothing will ever be found of it i was discharged and a great many others not the first time in this world i believe when the bottom of the hole was witchcraft here charlie put something hot in my glass the evenings are getting so dark and i never can see the moon and the water like that and the trees without remembering now ask me no more if you please good people when mrs shapland had finished this tale and was taking some well-earned refreshment polly and i looked at one another as much as to say that settles it nor did we press her with any more questions until her mind had recovered its tone by frying some slices of ham cut thin and half a dozen new laid eggs for us then i approached her with no small praise which she deserved and appeared so far as i could judge to desire perhaps and with a little skill on my part she was soon warmed up again having tasted egg flip to be sure of it yes captain wells you can see through the whole of it sailors can understand a river when nobody else knows anything the captain came forward as soon as he could and he says you fools what are you about an hour ago the tide was running five knots an hour where you be dragging if the poor children fell over they must be down river bar by this time and off he set out on a galloping horse to scurry the sand hills somehow and scurry was now the whole of it sir philip came forth and that poor squire philip and a thousand pounds was as freely talked of as if it was halfpence and every one was to be put in prison especially me if you please as blameless as the unborn babe was and that very night the princess were taken and died the next day upsetting everything ever so much worse than ever for poor squire philip fell into a trance so to say out of sheer vexation he cried out that the hand of the lord was upon him and too heavy for him to bear particular from his own brother and after that not an inch would he budge to make inquiry or anything but shut himself up in his dead wife's rooms and there he have moped from that day to this in a living grave as you may call it in reply to my question what reasons the squire or any one else might have for charging the captain with so vile a deed this excellent woman set them forth pretty much to the following purport first it was the captain himself who proposed the dancing on the terrace second it was his own man who drew her attention away from the children after a goblet of wine had been administered by the master third it was his own boat which was missing and never heard of afterwards fourth the captain himself disappeared from the party at the very time that the children were stolen and refused to say whither or why he was gone that active and shrewd man parson chowne no sooner heard of the loss than he raised a cry for the captain all over the terrace to come and command the fishermen and though as a friend of the family chowne would never express an opinion he could not undo that sad shake of the head which he gave when no captain could be found fifth a man with a captain's hat was seen burying two small bodies that night in the depth of braunton wilderness though nothing was heard of it till the next week through the savageness of the witness and by that time the fierce storm on the sunday had changed the whole face of the burrows so that to find the spot was impossible sixth it was now recalled to mind that drake bampfylde had killed a poor schoolfellow in his young days for which the lord had most righteously sent a shark in pursuit of him it was likely enough that he would go on killing children upon occasion seventh reason and perhaps worth all the rest only think what a motive he had for it no one else could gain sixpence by it 
drake bampfylde would gain everything the succession to the title and estates and immediate right to aspire to the hand of the beautiful heiress miss carey who was known to favour him an elderly woman who had been in the workhouse and throve upon that experience said that the captain would never have done it for he might have to do the like thing again every time the poor princess should happen to be confined almost but who could listen to this poor creature while the result lay there before them thus the common people reasoned but our susan attached no weight to any except the last argument as for one she knew quite well that the young seaman sauntered there quite by chance and quite by chance she spoke to him and as for wine she could take a quart of her father's cider and feel it less than she could describe to any one and as for a rummer of that stuff she had it was quite below contempt to her and concerning the captain just being away and declining to say where he was like a gentleman none but ignorant folk could pretend not to know what that meant of course he was gone between the dances for a little cool walk in the fir woods together with his isabel and to expose her name to the public with their nasty way of regarding things was utterly out of the question to a real british officer and to finish it mrs shapin said that she was almost what you might call a young woman even now at any rate with ten times the sense of any of the young ones were up to and ten years of her life she would give if charlie would allow of her to know what became of them two little dears and to punish the villain that wronged them hereupon my warmth of heart got the better of my prudence my wise and pure intention was to get out of this good woman all i could but impart to her nothing more than was needful just to keep her talking experience shows us that this need be very little indeed if anything in a female dialogue but now i was brought to such a pitch of tenderness by this time with my heart in a rapid pulse of descriptions and the egg flip going round sturdily also polly looking at me in a most beseeching way that i could not keep my own counsel even but was compelled to increase their comfort by declaring everything End of chapter sixty four chapter sixty five of the maid of scar this is a librivox recording all librivox recordings are in the public domain for more information or to volunteer please visit librivox dot org the maid of scar by r d blackmore chapter sixty five so does poor old davy hereupon you may well suppose that the grass must no longer grow under my feet with one man and positively two women in this very same county having possession of my secret how long could i hope to work this ladder to any good purpose luckily burrington lay at a very great distance from nympton on the moors and with no road from one to the other so that if mr and mrs shapland should fail of keeping their promised tightness at least two barnstaple market-days must pass before nympton heard anything and but for this consideration even their style of treatment would not have made me so confiding on the following morn while looking forth at pigs and calves and cocks and ducks i perceived that the crash must come speedily and resolved to be downright smart with it so after making a brisk little breakfast upon the two wings and two legs of a goose grilled with a trifle of stuffing there was but one question i asked before leaving many warm tears behind me good mistress shapland would you know that jemmy set of the child if you saw it captain wells i'm not quite a natural my own stitching done with a club-head all of it and of a three-line thread as my uncle's and nobody else had to barnstaple likewise the mark of the princess done a manigram as they call it the weather was dull and the time of year as stormy as any i know of nevertheless it was quite fine now and taking upon myself to risk five guineas out of my savings il Fracombe was the place i sought and found it with some difficulty thus might barnstaple bar be avoided and all the tumbling of inshore waters and thus with no more than a pilot yawl did i cross that dangerous channel at the most dangerous time of the year almost 
nothing less than my royal clothes and manifest high rank in the navy could have induced this fine old pilot to make sail for the opposite coast in the month of november when violent gales are so common with us but i showed him two alternatives three golden guineas on the one hand impressment on the other for a press-gang was in the neighbourhood now and i told him that i was its captain and that we laughed at all certificates and not being sure that this man and his son might not combine to throw me overboard steal my money and run back to port i took care to let them perceive my entry of their names and my own as well in the register of the coast-guard however they proved very honest fellows and we anchored under porth call point soon after dark that evening having proved to the pilot that he was quite safe here unless it should come on to blow from south-east of which there was no symptom and leaving him under the care of sandy who at my expense stood treat to him i made off for candleston not even stopping for a chat with roger burkrolls the colonel of course as well as his sister lady bluett and rodney were delighted with what i had to tell them while the maid herself listened with her face concealed to the tale of her own misfortune once or twice she whispered to herself oh my poor poor father and when i had ended she rose from the sofa where lady bluett's arm was around her and went to the colonel and said how soon will you take me to my father my darling bertha said the colonel embracing her as if she had been his daughter we will start to-morrow if llewellyn thinks the weather quite settled and the boat quite safe he knows so much about boats you see it would take us a week to go round by land but we won't start at all if you cry my dear i did not altogether like the tone of the colonel's allusion to me still less was i pleased when he interrupted lady bluett's congratulations thanks and fervent praises of my skill perseverance and trustiness in discovering all this villainy humph said the colonel i am not quite sure that this villainy would have succeeded so long unless a certain small boat had proved so adapted for fishing purposes why henry cried his sister how very unlike you what an unworthy insinuation after all mr llewellyn has done it is positively ungrateful and he spoke of that boat in this very room as i can perfectly well remember not oh not i am sure any more than a very few years ago my dear exactly said the colonel too few years ago if he had spoken of that at the time as distinctly as he did afterwards when the heat of inquiry was over and when sir philip himself had abandoned it i do not see how all this confusion between the loss of a foreign ship and the casting away of a british boat could have arisen or at any rate could have failed to be cleared away llewellyn you know that i do not judge hastily sir i condemn your conduct oh colonel how dreadful of you mr llewellyn go and look at the weather while i prove to the colonel his great mistake you did speak of the boat at that very inquest in the most noble and positive manner and nobody would believe you as you your very self told me what more could any man do we are none of us safe if we do our very best and have it turned against us my conscience all this time was beating so that i could hear it this is a gift very good men have and i have made a point of never failing to cultivate it in this trying moment with even a man so kind and blameless suddenly possessed no doubt by an evil spirit against me stanch as rock my conscience stood and to my support it rose creditably for both of us colonel lower my answer was you will regret this attack on the honour of a british officer one moreover whose great-grandfather harped in your honour's family captain bluett understands the build of a boat as well as i do he shall look at that boat to-morrow morning and if he declares her to be english built you may set me down with all my stripes and medals for a rogue sir but if he confirms my surety of her being a foreigner nothing but difference of rank will excuse you colonel lower from being responsible to me my spirit was up as you may see and the honour of the british navy forced me to speak strongly although my affection for the man was such that sooner than offend him i would have my other arm shot away 
llewellyn said the colonel with his fine old smile spreading very pleasantly upon his noble countenance you are of the peppery order which your old welsh blood produces think no more of my words for the present and if my nephew agrees with you in pronouncing the boat a foreigner i will give you full satisfaction by asking your pardon llewellyn it was enough to mislead any man not to dwell upon this mistake committed by so good a man but which got abroad somehow though my old friend crumpy i am sure could never have been listening at the door be it enough in this hurry to say that on the next morning i was enabled to certify the weather a smartish breeze from the north-northwest with the sea rather dancing than running took poor bardie to her native coast from which the hot tide had borne her before we set sail i had been to scar in colonel lower's two-wheeled gig and obtained from good moxy the child's jemmy set from the old oak chest it was stored in and now i did a thing which must for ever acquit me of all blame so wrongfully cast upon me that is to say i fetched out the old boat which sandy macraw had got covered up and releasing him in the most generous manner from years and years of back rent what did i do but hitch her on to the stern of the pilot yawl for to tow not only this but i managed that rodney should sail on board as her skipper and for his crew should have somebody who had crossed the channel before in that same poor and worthless boat sixteen years agone i do declare and they did carry on a bit now and then when our sprit sail hid them from our view for the day was bright and the sea was smooth the colonel and i were on board of the yawl enjoying perfect harmony for captain rodney of course had confirmed my opinion as to the build of the boat and his uncle desired to beg my pardon which the largeness of my nature quite refused to hear of if a man admits that he has wronged me satisfied i am at once and do not even point out always that i never could have done the like to him colonel lower had often been at sea in the time of his active service and he seemed to enjoy this trip across channel and knew all the names of the sails and spars but falling in as we did with no less than three or four small craft on our voyage he asked me how delushy's boat could possibly have been adrift for a whole night and day on the channel without any ship even sighting her i told him that this was as simple as could be during that state of the weather a burning haze or steam from the land lay all that time on the water and the lower part thereof was white while the upper part was yellow also the sea itself was white from the long continued calmness so that a white boat scarcely would show at half a mile of distance and even if it did what sailors were likely to keep a smart lookout in such roasting weather men talk of the heat ashore sometimes but i know that for downright smiting blinding and overwhelming sun-power there is nothing ashore to compare with a ship also i told the colonel now that his faith in me was re-established gliding over the water thus i was enabled to make plain to him things which if he had been ashore might have lain perhaps a little beyond his understanding i showed him the set of the tides by tossing corks from his bottles overboard and begging him to take a glass of my perspective to watch them and he took such interest in this and evinced so much sagacity that in order to carry on my reasoning with any perspicacity cork after cork i was forced to draw to establish my veracity because he would argue it out that a boat unmanned and even unmasted never could have crossed the channel as bardie's boat must needs have done i answered that i might have thought so also and had done so for years and years till there came the fact to the contrary of which i was pretty well satisfied now and when the boat was produced and sworn to who would not be satisfied also i begged to remind him how strongly the tide ran in our channel and that even in common weather the ebb of the spring out of barnstaple river might safely be put at four knots an hour till hartland point was doubled here about two in the morning the flood would catch the little wanderer and run her up channel some ten or twelve miles with the night wind on the starboard beam driving her also northward when this was exhausted the ebb would take her into swansea bay almost being so light a boat as she was with a southern breeze prevailing and then the next flood might well bring her to scar exactly the thing that had come to pass 
moreover i thought as i told the colonel although of course with diffidence from long acquaintance with tropical waters and the power of the sun upon them i thought it by no means unlikely that the intense heat of the weather then for more than six weeks prevailing might have had some strong effect on the set and the speed of the currents however no more of arguments what good can they do when the thing is there and no reasoning can alter it even parson chowne might argue and no doubt would with himself although too proud with other people that all he did was right and himself as good a man as need be we ran across channel in some six hours having a nice breeze abaft the beam and about the middle of the afternoon we landed at ifracombe cleverly this is a little place lying in a hole and with great rocks all around it fair enough to look at but more easy to fall down than to get up them and even the barnstaple road is so steep that the first hill takes nearly two hours of climbing therefore in spite of all eager spirits we found ourselves forced to stay there that night for no one would horse us onward so late at this november season perhaps however it was worth while to lose a few hours for the sake of seeing delushy's joy in her native land this like a newly opened spring arose and could not contain itself as soon as her foot touched the shore i began to look forward to a bout of it for i understand young women now very well though the middle-aged are beyond me these latter i hope to be up to if ever i live to the age of fourscore years as my constitution promises and if the lord should be pleased to promote me to the ripe and honest century as was done to my great-grandfather then i shall understand old women also though perhaps without teeth to express it however this was a pretty thing and it touched me very softly none but those who have roamed as i have understood the heart ache for my native land i had it ever and continually and in the roar of battle i was borne up by discharging it and so i could enter into our poor body going about with the tears in her eyes for she would not allow me to rest at the inn as i was fain to do in the society of some ancient fishermen and to leave the gentlefolk to their own manner of getting through the evening come out she cried old davy you are the only one that knows the way about this lovely place of course i had no choice but to obey sir philip's own granddaughter although i could not help grumbling and thus we began to explore a lane as crooked as a corkscrew and with ferns like palm-trees feathering in among them little trickling rills of water tinkled or were hushed sometimes by moss and it looked as if no frost could enter through the leafy screen above what a country to be born in what a country to belong to exclaimed the maid continually sipping from each crystal runnel and stroking the ferns with reverence uncle henry don't you think now that it is enough to make one happy to belong to such a land well my dear said her uncle henry as she had been ordered to call the colonel i think it would still more conduce to happiness for some of the land to belong to you ah llewellyn i see is of my opinion so i was and still more so next day when having surmounted that terrible hill we travelled down rich dairy valleys on our road to barnstaple here we halted for refreshment and to let delushy rest and beautify herself although we could see no need of that and now she began to get so frightened that i was quite vexed with her her first duty was to do me credit and how could she manage it if her eyes were red the colonel also began to provoke me for when i wanted to give the maid a stiff glass of grog to steady her he had no more sense than to countermand it and order a glass of cold water as soon as we came to narnton court we found a very smart coach in the yard that quite put to shame our hired chaise although the good colonel had taken four horses so as to land us in moderate style of course it was proper that i who alone could claim sir philip's acquaintance as well as the merit of the whole affair should have the pleasure of introducing his new grandchild to him so that i begged all the rest to withdraw and the only names that we sent in were captain llewellyn and miss delushy therefore we were wrong no doubt in feeling first a little grievance then a large-minded impatience and finally a strong desire i and not the desire alone to swear before we got out of it 
I speak of myself and Captain Bluett, two good, honest sailors, accustomed to declare their meaning since the war enabled them, but Colonel Lower, who might be said from his want of active service to belong to a past generation, as well as Delushy, who was scarcely come into any generation yet, these two really set an example, good though hard to follow. End of chapter 65chapter sixty six of the maid of scar this is a librivox recording all librivox recordings are in the public domain for more information or to volunteer please visit librivox dot org the maid of scar by r d blackmore chapter sixty six the maid at last is dentified however as too often happens we blamed a good man without cause a good man rarely deserves much blame whereas a bad man cannot have too much whether he has earned it or otherwise to restrain him from deserving more the reason why sir philip bampfylde kept us so long waiting proved to be a sound and valid one namely that he was engaged in earnest and important converse with his daughter-in-law lady bampfylde now wife if you will please to remember to commodore sir drake bampfylde although by birth entitled the honourable isabel carey the one that had been so good to me when i was a ferryman of superior order certainly but still no more than a ferryman since my rise in the world began i have found out one satisfactory thing that a man gets on by merit how long did i despair of this and smoke pipes and think over it seeing many of my friends advancing by what i call roguery and but for the war which proves the hearts and reins of men as my ancestor says i might still have been high and dry being too honest for the fish trade however true merit will tell in the end if a man contrives to live long enough so when the beautiful lady came out through the room where i sat waiting as i touched my venerable forelock to her as humbly as if for a sixpenny piece a brave man's honest pride wrought weakness in my eyes as i gazed at her i loved her husband and i loved her and i thought of the bitter luck between them which had kept them separate partly of course the glory of england and duty of a proud man's birth partly also bad luck of course and a style of giving in to it but ten times more than these the tricks that lower our fellow-creatures this noble and stately lady did not at first sight recognize me but when i had told her in very few words who i was and what i had done and how long i had sailed with her husband and how highly he respected me her eyes brightened into the old sweet smile although they bore traces of weeping my name is not lady carey she said for i was calling her thus on purpose not knowing how she was taking wedlock and being of opinion that an honourable miss ought always to be called a lady my name is lady bampfylde and i like it if you please although i remember mr llewellyn what your views are of matrimony you used to declare them only too plainly whenever we crossed your ferry for the purpose as i used to think of driving poor nanette to despair of you and a lucky thing for me your ladyship to have acted so consistently but his honour the commodore of course holds the opposite opinion it is hard to guess the opinions of a commodore always on service sir drake as i dare say you have heard can scarcely bear to come home now i saw that she was vexed by something and also vexed with herself perhaps for having even hinted it 
for she turned her beautiful face away and without a word would have left me but with my usual quickness of step i ran into the lobby place and back in a moment with our delushy clinging like a woodbine to a post at such moments i never speak until women begin with questions it saves so much time to let them begin because they are sure to insist on it meanwhile delushy was making the prettiest curtsy that presence of mind permitted you lovely dear why who are you cried lady bampfylde with a start that bade me dread hysterics i do not know madam answered delushy with the whole of her mind so well in hand by reason of years of suffering but many people believe me to be the bertha bampfylde that was lost nearly twenty years agone what the baby the baby at least one of the babies that my husband david llewellyn this is very cruel of you and that was all the thanks i got while wow, what could i have done otherwise in five minutes more she would have been off in her grand coach with six horses after offending sir philip so much that he could not have borne to look after her although of course he was now coming out like a gentleman to a visitor seeing such a pay night coming and a large confusion i begged colonel lower and captain bluett to keep for a little while out of it and nothing could more truly prove how thoroughly these were gentlemen than that they withdrew to a niche of the under butler's pantry wherein they could hear no word of it it was now my place to stand forward bravely and to put things clearly without any further loss of reason and even without considering how these delicate ladies might contrive to take my meaning nicely to spare good ladies from any emotion is one of the main things of my life although they show such a want of gratitude when i have done my utmost but as for frightening sir philip of course i had no scruple about that because of his confidence in the lord therefore abandoning lady bampfylde to the care of her maid who was running up from the servants hall to look after her i fixed my hook screwed on for the purpose firmly into delushy's sleeve that she might not faint or run away or do anything else unreasonable and i led her up the long hall to meet sir philip as he came down the steps at the upper end thereof the old general looked rather haggard and feeble as if the power of his life were lowered by perpetual patience but something had happened to vex him no doubt in his interview with lady bampfylde so that he walked with more than his usual stateliness and dignity he had never beheld me as a one-armed man nor yet in my present uniform for i took particular care to avoid him during the day or two spent at his house before i went to burrington so for a moment he did not know me but gazed with surprise at the lovely figure which i was sustaining so clumsily sir philip bampfylde allow me i said stretching forth my right hand to him to repay you for some of the countless benefits you have heaped upon me by presenting you with your long-lost granddaughter and your grandson to come afterwards it cannot be it cannot be was all he could say although for so many years he had shown his faith that it must be his fine old countenance turned as white as the silver hair that crowned it and then as red as it could have been in the hopeful blush of boyhood and the pure and perfect delicacy of high birth quickened with sorrow prevented him from examining delushy as he longed to do speak up child speak up said i giving her a haul with my hook 
as when first i landed her can't you tell your dear grandfather how glad you are to see him that i will with all my heart the maiden answered bashfully yet lifting her eyes to the old man's face with pride as well as reverence as soon as i perceive that you sir wish to hear me say it you will not think me rude i am scarcely strong enough for this it has come on me so suddenly and it must be quite as bad for you lead the young lady to a chair llewellyn or stay i beg your pardon it will perhaps be better to call our kind and worthy housekeeper sir philip perceived a thing which had escaped me though brought to my notice beforehand by our good colonel lower that is to say how hard it would be upon the feelings of this young girl to have her identity as crowner bowles entitled it discussed in her own presence therefore she was led away by that regular busybody the housekeeper mrs cockhanterbury while i begged leave to introduce colonel lower and captain bluett to sir philip bampfylde and then when all had made their bows and all due salutations i was called upon to show my documents and explain the evidence so carefully gathered by me it is as much above my power as beyond my purpose to tell how that ancient and noble gentleman after so much worry from the long neglect of providence took as if he had never deserved it this goodness of the lord to him of course in my class of life we cannot be always dwelling on children whose nature is provoking always and in nothing more so than that they will come when not wanted yet are not forthcoming with the folk who can afford them nevertheless i think that if the lord had allowed any thief of a fellow much more one of his own ministers to steal two grandchildren of mine and make a savage of one baby and of the other a castaway the whole of my piety would have been very hard pushed to produce any gratitude sir philip however did appear most truly desirous to thank god for this great mercy vouchsafed to him even before he had thoroughly gone through the ins and outs of the evidence for he begged us to excuse him while he should go to see to our comfort and two fine bottles of wine white and red appeared and began to disappear under my hatches mainly before our noble host came back to set us a good example and when he came he had quite forgotten to dust the knees of some fine kerseymere and the shins of black silk stockings deep sense of religion is quite in its place when a man has had one arm shot off still more so if both arms are gone and after a leg indispensable nevertheless it must not be intruded upon any one no not even by the chaplain till the doctor shakes his head knowing also that colonel lower had a tendency towards it enough to stop the decanters if he should get upon that subject with the arguments it sticks fast in i was delighted to see delushy slipping into the room as if she had known the place for a century the general clearly had managed to visit her during the time of his absence from us what passed between them matters not except that he must have acknowledged her for now she went up to him and kissed him rather timidly perhaps but still she touched his forehead then he arose and stood very upright as if he had never begun to stoop and passing his arm round her delicate waist both her hands he took in his and as they faced us we were struck with the likeness between blooming youth and worn but yet majestic age gentlemen he said or rather i should call you kind good friends you have brought me not only a grandchild but the very one i would have chosen if the whole world gave me choice by and by you shall see her stand by the picture of my 
dear and long lamented wife that i think will convince you that we want no further evidence for me these thumbnails are enough bertha show your thumbnails she laughed her usual merry laugh although she had been crying so while she spread her dainty hands exactly as she used to spread them when she was only two years old with me alone to look at her here it is sir cried the general overlooking me in the rush of his sentiments towards the colonel here is the true bampfylde mark even the bassets have it not nor the tracys nor the st albans will you oblige me by observing that these two thumbnails have a most undoubted right and left to them bertha do try to keep still for a moment well i declare said the colonel calmly taking out his eyeglass yes i declare you are right my good sir here is a most evident right and left andalusia do stand still not only in the half moons at the base but in the vein and what i may call the radiance of the pinkness i cannot express my meaning but my darling come and kiss me this delushy did at once as for years she used to do and not being certain even now whether she ought to forsake the colonel for a general though proved to be a very fine and newly turned-up grandfather none of us had thought of her and the many shifts of female wind coming to pass perhaps inside her little brain and heart so wherefore this poor david who desires always to be the last but by force of nature is compelled forever to take the lead i it was who got her off to bed that we might talk of her end of chapter sixty six chapter sixty seven of the maid of scar this is a librivox recording all librivox recordings are in the public domain for more information or to volunteer please visit librivox dot org the maid of scar by r d blackmore chapter sixty seven dog eats dog to a man whose time of life begins to be a subject of some consideration to him when the few years still in hope can be counted on a hand and may not need a finger and with the tide of this world ebbing to the inevitable sea to him there is scarcely any sweet and gentle pastime more delightful than to sit on a bank of ancient moss beside a tidal river and watch the decreasing waters and prove his own eternity by casting a pebble into them hence it was that sir philip bampfylde on the very morning after i gave him back his grandchild sat gazing into the ebb of the taw some fifty yards below the spot whence jack wildman's father carried off so wickedly that helpless pair of children here it was my privilege to come up to sir philip and spread before him my humble reasons for having preferred the kitchen last night to the dining-room and the drawing-room it was consistent with my nature and he though wishing otherwise agreed not to be offended then i asked him how the young lady whose health every one of us had honoured all over the kitchen-table had contrived to pass the night and whether she had seen her father yet he said she had slept pretty well considering but that as concerned her father they had not thought it wise to let her see him until the doctor came there was no telling how it might act upon squire philip's constitution after so many years of misery cobwebs and desolation for providence had not gifted him with a mind so strong as his father's was and the sudden break in on the death of the mind has been known in such a case to lead to bodily decease but few things vex the general more than that wretched lie of chowns and slander upon a loyal family while in service of the crown what captain drake had landed from the boat 
was not an armed chest but a chest of plate and linen belonging to his brother which he would no longer borrow while the squire so cruelly dealt with him then i asked sir philip whether the ancient builder over at appledore had been sent for to depose to the boat for we had brought that little craft on the top of our coach from ilfracombe the general said that i might see him even now examining her if i would only take the trouble to look round the corner but he himself was so well convinced without any further testimony that he did not even care to hear what the old man had to say of it any more than he cared for the jemmy set this however is not my manner of regarding questions not from any private fountains of conviction and so on but out of the mouths of many witnesses shall a thing be established therefore i hastened round the corner to sift this ancient boatwright as surly a fellow as ever lived and from his repugnance to my uniform one who had made more money i doubt by the smuggler's keg than the shipwright's ads entering into his nature at sight i took the upper hand of him as my rank insisted on hark ye now master ship carpenter where was this little craft put together according to your opinion either this fellow was deaf as a post or else he meant to insult me for he took no more notice of me than he did of the pigs that were snuffling at beech nuts down by the side of the landing-place i am not the right man to put up with insolence therefore i screwed my hammer-head into the socket below my muscles and therewith dealt him a tap on his hat just to show what might come afterwards receiving this administration and seeing that more was very likely from the same source to be available what did this rogue do but endeavour to show the best side of his manners wherefore to let him have his say here is his opinion this here boat be the same as i built year as my wife were took with quinsy and were called home by the lord i built her for wild duck of appledore a little dandy rigged craft as used to be hired by cap'n bampfylde to this here boat i can swear although some big rogue have been at work painting her as knew not how to paint and a lubber no doubt every now and then patching her up or repairing of her the name and her stern have been painted up from wild duck appledore into santa lucia salvador three or four letters are my own the rest are the work of some pirate she be no more foreign built than i be but a sailor accustomed to foreign parts would be sure to reckon so reason why i serve my time with a builder over to port o prince and i should like to see the man anywhere round these here parts as can tuck in the bends as i does leaving this conceited fellow to his narrow unpleasantness i turned my head and there beheld captain bluett hearkening come he cried out in his hearty manner what a cook's boiling of fools we are here we are chewing a long chewed quid while the devil that brewed this gale of wind may fly far away and grin at us llewellyn do you mean to allow hush i said softly for that low shipwright showed his eyes coming up under his cap and i saw that he was that particular villain after his scurrilous words about me who would sell his soul to that wretch of a chown for half a crown a week almost therefore i led our young captain bluett well away out of this fellow's hearing davy said he we all know your courage your readiness and your resources still you appear to be under a spell and you know you are superstitious about this cunning and cowardly blackguard who frightens the whole of this country as he never could frighten glamorganshire i have no fear of him sir i said i will go with you to confront him why your teeth are ready to chatter llewellyn and your lips are blue you who stood like a milestone they tell me at the helm of the goliath or like a clock going steadily tick before we fired a shot and with both shell and shot through your grey whiskers but captain a minister of the lord master a minister of the devil 
once for all to-day i go to horsewhip him if he is young enough or to pull his nose if he is old enough and old harry be with him in choice of the two zounds sir is it a thing to laugh at rodney bluett was well known to every one who served under him for the mildness of his language and the want of oaths he had and so of course for his self-control and the power of his heart when it did break forth everybody loved him because he never cursed any one at a venture and kept himself very close to facts however hard driven by circumstances so that i was now amazed to hear this young man spoil my pipe with violent emotions have you consulted sir philip i asked it is his place to take up the question what question there is no question the thing is proved my duty is plain sir philip is too old to see to it the squire is a spoony the commodore is not here yet i have spoken to his wife who is a very sweet and wise lady and she agrees with me that it will save the family a world of scandal and perhaps failure of the law for me to take the law into my own hands and thrash this blackguard within an inch of his life to be sure and save her husband from the risk of tackling a desperate man it is most wise on her part but i beg you my dear sir for the sake of your dear uncle and your good mother keep clear of this quarrel you know not the man you have to deal with even if you can thrash him which is no easy business he will shoot you afterwards he is the deadest shot in the county hurrah cried rodney tossing up his hat that entirely settles it come along old fellow and show us the way and not a word to any one now this may seem a very mad resolve for a man of my sense to give in to but whether i turned myself this way or that i could see no chance of bettering it if i refused to go young rodney as i could see by the set of his mouth would go alone and perhaps get killed and then how could any of the family ever look at me again on the other hand if i should go to the colonel or to the general for opinion and to beg them to stop it my interference nine chances to one would only end in giving offence among the superior orders add to this my real desire to square it out with chowne himself after all his persecution and you may be able to forgive me for getting upon horseback after many years of forbearance and with my sugar nipper screwed on to lay hold by the forestay if she should make bad weather also i felt it my duty to take a double-barrel pistol heavily loaded and well primed captain rodney forged ahead so on a real hunting craft that my dapple grey being warranted not to lurch me overboard could not keep in line whatever sail i made upon her my chief rule in life is not to hurry what good ever comes of it people only abuse you and your breath is too short to answer them moreover i felt an uneasy creaking in my bends from dousing forward and then easing backward as a man must do who knows how to ride the captain was wroth with me out of all reason but as he could not find the way to nympton moors without me i was enabled to take my leisure having the surety of overgetting him when the next cross-road came therefore it was late afternoon when we turned into the black fir grove which led up to the house of chowne and rodney bluett clutched the big whip in his hand severely for we had asked at the little inn of which i spoke a long time ago whether the parson was now at home ay that un be said the man with a grin for we did not see the landlady but ye best way not to go nigh un already i seemed not to feel as i hoped in the earlier stage of the journey my thoughts had been very upright for a while and spirited and delighted but now i began to look at things from a different point of view almost it is not man's business to worry his head about righting of wrongs in this world unless they are done to himself and if so revenge is its name and an ugly one long life leads one to forgive when to carry it on would be troublesome through the drip of dying leaves the chill of dull november now began to darken over us as we turned the corner of chowne's own road and faced his lonely mansion the house had a heavy and sullen look according to my ideas not receiving light and pleasure of the sun when possible heavy fir trees overhung it never parting with their weight and the sunset when there was any could not pierce the home oaks what a gloomy and devilish place cried rodney bluett beginning to tremble from some unknown influence upon my soul if i lived here i should be hatching plots myself or is it the nature of the man that has made the place so horrible 
let us go back said i come back my good sir i conjure you such a man should be left to god to punish in his own good time hark cried rodney pulling up and listening through the gloomy wood that was a woman's scream i am sure is he murdering some more little ones we listened and heard a loud piercing shriek that made our hair stand on end almost so mad was it and so unearthly and then two more of yet wilder agony and after that a long low wailing on on cried rodney bluett you know these paths gallop on davy you go first i answered your horse is fresher i am coming to be sure i am do you think i am frightened well i don't know he replied but i am not ashamed to own that i am clapping spurs to his horse he dashed on and thoroughly miserable as i felt there was nothing for me but to follow him in the name of the lord what a sight we came on where the drive sweeps round at the corner of the house under a dark tree of some sort and on a garden bench we discovered the figures of two women or rather one sat on the bench the other lay stretched on the ground with her head cast recklessly back on the ledge her hair spread in masses over it and both hands pressed on her eyes and ears to shut out sight and hearing her lips were open and through her white teeth came wails of anguish that would have been shrieks if nature had not failed her but the elder woman sat upright in scorn of all such weakness with her gaunt figure drawn like a cable taut no sign of a tear on her shrunken cheeks and the whole of her face as numb and cold as an iced figurehead in the arctic seas yet no one with knowledge of the human race could doubt which of these two suffered most we reined up our horses and gazed in terror for neither of them noticed us and then we heard from inside the house sounds that made our flesh creep barking howling snapping of teeth baying as of a human bloodhound frothy splutterings of fury and then smothered yelling her have a gad un now cried a clown running round the end of the house as if he were enjoying it reckon our passin won't bait much more after passin jack be atop of un oh sir oh sir oh for god's sake sir cried the poor lady who had lain on the ground rushing up to us and kneeling and trying to get hold of us you must have come to stop it sir only one hour allow him one hour dear dear sir for repentance he has not been a good man i know but i am his own wife good kind sirs and if he could only have a little time if it were only half an hour he might he might here a sound of throttling came through a broken window-pane and down she fell insensible what does it mean cried rodney bluett is it murder madness or suicide follow me davy here i go anyhow into the thick of it he dashed through the window and i with more caution cocking my pistol followed him while i heard the clown shouting after us danged vools both the e bide outside bide outside i tell ee oh that we had remained outside i have been through a great deal of horrible sights enough to harden any man and cure him of womanly squeamishness yet never did i behold or dream of anything so awful as the scene that lay before me people were longing to look at it now but none save ourselves durst enter it was chowne's own dining-room all in the dark except where a lamp had been brought in by a trembling footman who ran away knowing that he brought this light for his master to be strangled by and in the corner now lay his master smothered under a feather-bed yet with his vicious head fetched out in the last rabid struggle to bite there was the black hair black face and black tongue shown by the frothy wainscot or between it and the ticking on the feather-bed lay exhausted and with his mighty frame convulsed so that a child might master him parson jack rambone the strongest man whose strength like all other powers had laid a horrible duty upon him sobbing with all his great heart he lay yet afraid to take his weight off and sweating at every pore with labour peril of his life and agony oh dick dick he said quite softly and between his pantings how many larks have we had together and for me to have to do this to you i am sure you knew me before you died i think you know me now dick oh for god's sake shut your eyes darling dick are you dead are you dead you are the very cleverest fellow ever i came across of you can do it if you like oh dear dick dick my boy do shut your eyes we stood looking at them with no power to go up to them 
all experience failed us as to what was the proper thing to do till i saw that chowne's face ought to have a napkin over it none had been laid for dinner but i knew where butlers keep them when i had done this parson jack who could not escape from the great black eyes arose and said i thank you sir he staggered so that we had to support him but not a word could we say to him i am bitten in two places if not more he rather gasped than said to us as he laid bare his enormous arms i care not much i will follow my friend or if the lord should please to spare me henceforth i am an altered man and yet for the sake of my family will you heat the kitchen poker End of chapter 67chapter sixty eight of the maid of scar this is a librivox recording all librivox recordings are in the public domain for more information or to volunteer please visit librivox dot org the maid of scar by r d blackmore chapter sixty eight the old pitcher at the well again it helps a thoughtless man on his road towards a better kingdom to get a glimpse every now and then of such visitations of the lord when i was a little boy nothing did me so much good in almost all the bible as to hear my father read the way in which herod was eaten of worms and now in mature years i received quite a serious turn by the death of this parson chowne of ignominious canine madness and still more when i came to know by what condign parental justice this visitation smote him but while the women were busy upstairs by candlelight and with some weeping it fell to parson rambone's lot to lay the truth before us this great man took at once to captain rodney bluett as if he had known him for years nor did he fail to remember me and in his distress to seek some comfort from my simple wisdom so having packed all the country boobies constables doctors and so on out of the house we barred the door made a bright fire in the kitchen and sat down in front of it while a nice cook began to toss up some sweetbreads and eggs and ham collops and so on for our really now highly necessary sustenance you may remember the time i met with a very nice fellow then chowne's head groom who gave me a capital supper of tripe elegantly stewed by a young cookmaid himself lamenting the stress laid upon him by circumstances not to make his wife of her he told me then with a sigh of affection between his knife and fork that social duties compelled him instead to marry a publican's daughter with fifty pounds down on the nail he believed if it was a penny nevertheless he felt confident that all would be ordered aright in the end now providence had not allowed such a case of faith to pass unrewarded he married the publican's daughter got her money and paid the last sad duties to her out of the pocket of his father-in-law in a christian-minded manner and then back he came to nympton rectory and wedded that same cookmaid who now was turning our ham so cleverly with the egg slice thus we could speak before them both without the least constraint and indeed he helped us much by his knowledge of the affairs of the family also two justices of the peace who had signed the warrant for poor chowne's end upon the report of the doctors but could find no one of strength and courage to carry it out except parson jack these sat with us to get their supper before the long cold ride over the moors and there sat parson jack himself with his thick hands trembling hopeless of eating a morsel but dreading to be left alone for a moment what a difference it will make in all this neighbourhood to be sure so said one of their worships ay that it will answered his brother magistrate since tom faggus died there has not been such a man to be found 
nowhere round these here parts no nor tom faggus himself said the other a noble highwayman he were but for mine not fit to hold a candle to our lamented friend now lying up there in the counterpane parson jack shuddered and shook his great limbs and feigned to have done so on purpose and then in defiance collected himself and laid his iron hand on the table watching every great muscle to see how long he could keep it from trembling then i arose and grasped his hand for nobody else understood him at all and he let me take it with reluctance wonder and then deep gratitude he had been saying to himself as i knew though his lips never moved and his face was set in scorn of all our moralizing within himself he had been thinking i am jack ketch i am worse i am cain i have murdered my own dear brother and i who had seen him brand his bitten arm with the red-hot poker laying the glowing iron on until the blood hissed out at it i alone could gauge the strength of heart that now enabled him to answer my grasp with his poor scorched arm and to show his great tears and check them enough of this i cannot stand these melancholy subjects a man of irreproachable life with a tendency towards gaiety never must allow his feelings to play ducks and drakes with him if the justice of the almighty fell upon chowne as i said it would let chowne die and let us hope that his soul was not past praying for it is not my place to be wretched because the biggest villain i ever knew showed his wit by dying of a disease which gave him power to snap at the very devil when in the fullness of time he should come thirsting to lay hold of him and but for my purpose of proving how purely justice does come home to us well contented would i be to say no more about him why had he been such a villain through life because he was an impostor why did he die of rabid madness under the clutch of his own best friend because he lashed his favourite hound to fly at the throat of his own grandfather not only does it confirm one's faith in the honesty of breeding but it enables me to acquit all the chowns of devonshire and a fine and wholesome race they are of ever having produced such a scamp in true course of legitimacy also enables me not to point out so much as to leave all my readers to think of the humble yet undeniable traces of old davy's sagacity what had i said to mrs steelyard when she overbore me so upon an empty stomach madam i said your son you mean and it proved to be one of my famous hits at a range beyond that of other men when great stirs happen truth comes out as an earthquake starts the weasels everybody knows what fine old age those wandering gipsies come to the two most killing cares we have are money and reputation here behold gipsy wisdom the disregard of the latter of the two does away with the plague of the former they take what they want while we clumsy fellows toil for the cash as the only way to get the good estimation hence it was that chowne's grandfather came about stealing as lively as ever at the age of ninety a wiry and leathery man he was and had once been a famous conjurer and now in his old age he came to sleep in his grandson's barn and to live on his grandson's ducks potatoes and pigeons this was last harvest time just as chowne was enjoying his bit of cub hunting turning in from his sport one day in a very sulky humour with the hounds he was educating the parson caught his grandfather withdrawing in a quiet manner from a snug little hen-roost 
not knowing who it was for his mother had never explained the thing to him not even that she was his mother he thought it below his dignity to ride after this old fellow but at his heels stalked a tall young hound who had vexed him all day by surliness and was now whipped in for punishment at him loo boy he called out hike forward catch him by the leg boy but the hound only showed his teeth and snarled so that chowne let out his long lash at him in a moment the dog sprang at his master who was riding a low cob horse and bit him in the thigh and the horse in the shoulder and then skulked off to his kennel the hound was shot and the horse shared his fate in less than six weeks afterwards and as for the parson we know too well what they were forced to do with him in her first horror that stony woman even mrs steelyard when her son came ravening at her could not keep her secret it is the judgment of god she cried after all there is a god he set the dogs at his grandfather and now he would bite his own mother how she had managed to place him in the stead of the real chown heir i never heard or at least no clear account of it for she was not as we know already one who would answer questions let him rest whoever he was his end was bad enough even for him enough of this fright for it was a fright even to me i assure you let us come back to the innocent people injured so long by his villainy to begin with parson jack never in all his life had he taken a stroke towards his own salvation until by that horrible job he earned repentance fear and conscience and not only this for none of these would have stood him in any service with chowne still at his elbow but that the face which had drawn him for years like a lodestone of hell to destruction now ever present in its terror till his prayers got rid of it shone in the dark like the face of a scarecrow if ever he durst think of wickedness his wife found the benefit of this change and so did his growing family and so did the people who flocked to his church in the pleasure of being afraid of him in the roads he might bite but in his surplice he was bound to behave himself or at least he must bite the church warden first yet no one would have him to sprinkle a child until a whole year was over and then he restored himself under a hint from a man beyond him in intellect he made everybody allow that the poker had entirely cured him by preaching from the bottom of his chest with a glass of water upon the cushion a sermon that stirred every heart with the text is thy servant a dog that he should do this thing i quit him with sorrow because i found him a man of true feeling and good tobacco we got on together so warmly that expense alone divided us he would have had me for parish clerk if i could have seen my way to it what prevails with a man like me foremost first of everything why love of the blessed native land which every good welshman will love me for i may have done a thing now and then below our native dignity except to those who can enter into all the things we look at it is not our nature altogether to go for less than our value we know that we are of the oldest blood to be found in this ancient island and we ask nothing more than to be treated as the superior race should be in the presence of such great ideas who cares what becomes of me i really feel that my marriage to polly and prolongation of a fine old breed scarcely ought to be spoken of a man who has described the battle of the nile need not dwell on matrimony hurried speech does not become me on any subject everybody has the right to know and everybody does know how the whole of north devon was filled with joy talk and disputation as to commodore bampfylde and the brightness of his acquittal they drew him from barnstaple in a chaise with only two springs broken 
men having taken the horses out and done their best at collar work he would have gladly jumped out and kicked them but for the feeling of their good will nothing would have detracted from this and the feasts that were felt to be due upon it if squire philip had only known how not to die at a time when nobody was seasonably called on to think of death but when he learned the shame inflicted by himself on his ancient race through trusting chowne and misbelieving his brother out of the self-same wound and above all when he learned that chowne was the bastard of a gipsy he cast himself into his brother's arms fetched one long sigh and departed to a better world with his hat on this was the best thing that he could do if he had chosen the time aright and it saved a world of trouble sir philip felt it a good bit of course and so did sir drake bampfylde nevertheless if a living man withdraws into a shell so calmly what can he expect more lively than his undertakers this was good and left room for harry or rather young philip bampfylde to step into the proper shoes and have practice how to walk in them yet he was so caught with love of service and of the navy and so mad about nelson that the general could not help himself but let him go to sea again nelson is afloat just now the crappos and the dons appear to have made up their minds against us and the former have the insolence to threaten a great invasion if i only had two arms i would leave my polly to howl about me as it is they have turned me into a herring colonel lower has raised a regiment and i am first drill sergeant our dear maid of scar would also give her beautiful son only six months old bampfylde lower bluet to go to the wars and to fight the french if any one could only show her the way to do without him he cocks up his toes in a manner which proves that his feet are meant for ratlines how the war is raging i run to and fro upon hearing of felix farley's journal and am only fit to talk of it sir philip comes down with his best tobacco whenever he stops at candleston and a craft has been built for me on purpose by the old fellow at appledore and her name it is the maid of scar to dance across the channel whenever a one-armed man can navigate colonel lower and even lady bluet have such trust in me that they cross if their dear delushy seems to pine too much for her husband and the maid herself has brought her son as proud as if he came out of a wreck to exhibit him to moxy and roger and bunny and straddling the clerk in a word to all the parish and the extra parochial district now i hope that nobody will ask me any more questions concerning any one male or female if i cannot speak well of a person my rule is to be silent hezekiah found his knavery altogether useless he scraped himself home at last and built a bellows organ at bridge end with a seventy four gun crash to it his reputation is therefore up especially since he rejoined the church in all churches that can afford him yet he will not always own that i was his salvation hepzibah prophesies nothing except that polly's little son david llewellyn will do something wonderful to keep the ancient name up it may be so and i think that he will but his father never did it how many chances have i missed how many times might i have advanced to stern respectability yet some folk will like me better and i like myself no less for not having feigned to be more than i am a poor frail fellow the children still come down to the well with three of our bunnies foremost they get between my knees and open blue or brown eyes up at me in spite of roger burkwell's nodding to instil more manners some of the prettiest stroke my white beard coaxing for a story then they push forward little davy thinking that i spoil him so because of his decided genius giving such promise of bardhood already it would do you good to hear him on the jew's harp nevertheless i answer firmly nine times out of ten at least little dears is all i say captain davy is getting old it is hard to tell a tale but easy to find fault with it 
you tell me that my left arm will grow quite as long as my right one if i only will shake it about and keep a hollow sleeve on my pets when i get another arm i will tell you another story end of chapter sixty eight the end of the maid of scar by r d blackmore